Mukherjee, Aditya Mukherjee to come on the dais so that we can begin and then invite our guest this morning, uh, Hamid Ansari Saab, to give his inaugural address. Professor Habib. Sh Ma'am, please. please. Sorry. Now I request Hamid uh, Sari Saab to come on the dais, please. Aditya Mukherjee. Sorry. It's an academic session, so uh, History Congress is an academic session, so like all academic sessions, there are confusions, there are chaos, and after the chaos, things settle down. So we have early morning chaos a bit, we are settling down now. I'm Rakesh Bhattabhyal, welcoming you formally for this session. The Gandhi panel begins, uh, this is 150th anniversary of uh, the father of the nation, and we thought it would be fitting his, uh, uh, his legacy and our own legacy of History Congress to have a full day, uh, a day, a day and a half session on his memory and legacies that he bequeathed on us. Now, uh, to give you just a brief sense um, of the ses sessions that we have, we have distinguished historians, distinguished um, thinkers, someone who, uh, we have people like um, those who have disciplinary, cross-disciplinary boundaries and come to uh, talk about different uh, essences of uh, Gandhi and uh, the kind of context in which he lived and context that we live and how to bridge those through our disciplinary and thinking connections. So we have a, a galaxy of people from different parts, different parts of the world, different parts of the academia. Uh, or not only academia, we have um, um, even service officers who are intervening in a very meaningful way to our social life through Gandhian methods and technique. Now I leave, uh, I, as I said, I welcome you all this morning. And with this short note, uh, we are very lucky that we have uh, got a new a publisher who actually specializes in distributing books in Africa, we thought since there is a statue of Gandhi which was pulled down in Ghana, we will have the publisher and distributor who will publish our work uh, in Africa so that we can reach our voice there rather than just market our voice inside. So we have a, a very genuine publisher this morning. We signed an agreement that he will publish the volume of this uh, session and distribute primarily in Africa so that we again rebuild our connection through, our, through Gandhi in that sense. I leave uh, now and leave it to Professor Mudra Mukherjee to chair the session uh, and take the proceedings further. Thank you. Dear friends, uh, since we are already running late, I will keep my preliminary remarks very, very short and just a very brief introduction to the speaker of the day, uh, the Honorable Sri Hamid Ansari ji. We are very, very grateful to him for agreeing to come and inaugurate this panel. When it was being organized uh, with Rakesh and we were discussing who could be a very suitable person, especially in the context of our times, because we also want to look at Gandhi in our times. And his was the name that spontaneously came forward from all of us as a person who has upheld some of the most vital the Mahatma. We have been looking up to him as a leader. We wait for his comments and he has been performing that role of a public intellectual and a leader very, very admirably. 
So we are really delighted to have him here with us. He does not need any introduction to all of you. He's been in public life for long enough for all of you to know. But I just want to in one line say that he's had a distinguished career, as all of you know, as a diplomat, a member of India's most pre prestigious Indian Foreign Service, of which a very large portion he spent in the Middle East, West Asia, and has written a number of very fine works on that region. He's also represented us at the UN and at uh, various other uh, important international arena. After his career as a diplomat, he came into uh, the education world and he served as the vice chancellor of the very prestigious Aligarh Muslim University. Then he was also briefly member of the Minorities uh, Commission and then he became the Vice President of India, where he was uh, the first uh, Vice President after, uh, I think, uh, uh, Sarvapalli uh, Radhakrishnan uh, to serve two terms. And we are uh, honored again that we have him in our midst. And without further ado, I will request him to give his keynote address. Thank you. Very distinguished historians uh, on the podium here. Irfan Sahib, of course. And friends. It's easy to speak about Mahatma Gandhi and difficult to speak about Mahatma Gandhi. So I really do not know where to begin the subject suggested to me was the ethics of Gandhi and I thought I needed to qualify that slightly by adding to it the dead weight of statecraft. A non-historian in a house full of those who worship at the temple of Nemocene, the goddess, Greek goddess of memory, is an oddity. I accepted your invitation without considering its possible consequences and can ascribe it only to an occasional propensity to succumb to temptation. Even though history was not the discipline formally pursued by me, I confess to have dabbled in it from time to time. And I recall Ibn Khaldun's dicta that the posture of stupidity is unwholesome to mankind and that the historian in his quest for truth should lift the veil from the conditions of previous generations to wash his hands of any blind trust in tradition. History and particularly recent history thus remains critically relevant to our daily life, to the perceptions that shape our approach to contemporary questions and to the lessons that we have we tend to draw from the proximate or distant past. Sorry. Our subject today is India at the making of modern India. The subcontinent as an entity can be defined geographically in geological terms and as sufficiently ancient in cultural terms. In political terms, however, its contours are recent. The historical process of the latter, as depicted by 
Tilak and some others was that of a period of nation in the making. Nationhood therefore could not be taken for granted and had to be constantly developed and consolidated. This process was undertaken by the freedom movement which defined its diverse identity and plurality and provided a platform for articulating it. This nation in the making exercise necessarily had many dimensions. It meant freedom from constraint as also freedom to act in pursuit of certain desired objectives. The struggle to be free to decide our own destiny involved in the first place a moral and ethical judgment about the desirability of freedom. Next to it was the question of methodology. How to achieve this objective and how not to proceed in pursuit of it. The religio-philosophical legacy of the Indian civilization was an essential reality and had its impact in varying degrees on Indian minds. The initiation and consolidation of the British rule in India also resulted in the emergence of a class of Indians who imbibed modern education and familiarized themselves with many of the principles that were being articulated in the philosophical, political, and legal debates in the world beyond our borders. Both of these streams of thought influenced those who led the freedom movement and both impacted on the ideas of the Mahatma. Gandhiji once told an interlocutor that most religious men I have met are politicians in disguise. I, however, wear the guise of a politician. I, however, who wears the guise of a politician is in reality at heart a religious man. My bent is not political but religious. He said to him, religion meant not a particular creed, but, and I quote, belief in the ordered moral government of the universe and is identical with morality. That has to be embedded in truth, end of quote. How did Gandhiji express this in practical terms? He looked upon politics as an unavoidable evil involving the control and use of state authority which is essentially coercive. If I seek to take part in politics, he said, it is only because politics today encircles us like the coil of a snake from which one cannot get out no matter how one tries. I wish to wrestle with the snake. I am trying to introduce religion into politics. By religion, he meant not a particular faith, but the underlying principles that harmonize all faiths. The Rajghat at New Delhi is visited reverentially by the public, ritually by public figures, and out of curiosity by tourists. A little away from the Samadhi is a stone tablet with an inscription on it. The inscription is Seven Social Sins. These are listed on the tablet. What are these seven? One. Politics without principle. Two, pleasure without conscience. Three, wealth without work. Four, knowledge without character. 
5. Commerce without morality. 6. Science without humanity. And 7. Worship without sacrifice. Each of these is a statement of principle that can be comprehended, interpreted, and implemented individually and collectively. On my part, I would like to discern a pattern in the last words of each dictum. What are those last words? Principle, conscience, work, character, morality, humanity, and sacrifice. A similar pattern summing up different forms of human activity is discerned when the first words of the statements are put together. In the Ghanaian approach, therefore, conscience is motivated by considerations of humanity and sacrifice to develop a moral character that holds aloft, aloft in its work the banner of a principled approach. The reverse of it would be selfishness induced by unprincipled opportunistic approach to work. The latter would produce neither justice nor humaneness. On this approach, the choice would be clear if the human being is a moral creature having a sense of right and wrong in his individual and group conduct. Gandhi's philosophy dealt with the method of regulating along non-violent lines group life in its political, economic, national and international aspects. Thus the Gandhian state was meant to be a non-violent state in which authority would be diffused and will perform its functions with a minimum of coercion. Here we are confronted with a set of questions. One, can the principles of public morality be different from those of private morality? Two, can a society have one set of ethical norms for governing con conduct of public institutions and another set of norms for citizens in their individual capacity. And three, is the state required to observe norms of behavior in its functioning, firstly in relation to its citizens and secondly in interstate relations. In a Gandhian approach, the answer is in the negative to the first two questions and in affirmative to the third. In other words, the theory of morality has to be a unified one rather than occasion differentiated. Such an approach would be in consonance with Gandhi's philosophy of a code of morality universally applicable. It would also embody the essence of the preamble of our constitution and the injunctions in Article 30, uh, I beg your pardon, Article 51 and Article 51A. The alternative of having different sets of principles for judging an individual's or a society's moral or legal actions can only promote legal confusion or amoral or immoral judgments that may tide over specific situations but could end up doing longer term damage to a society's ethos. It will of course be argued, as Lord Grey did in the year 1828, that and he said, I am a great lover of morality, public and private, but the intercourse of nations cannot be strictly regulated by that rule, end of quote. This, however, is a slippery slope 
and has been used down the ages for state conduct that violates the norms of legality. The global community in any case has in recent decades moved some distance towards the development of normative standards, however imperfect, be they in human rights, environmental protection, or even brazen use of force. An instance of the dead weight of statecraft is the debate on the law of sedition, section 124A of the Indian Penal Code. It was drafted by our colonial masters to suppress expression of opinion not to the liking of the government. Gandhiji accepted the charge and caused consternation with the presiding judge calling him a man of high ideals and of noble and even saintly life. A good number of freedom fighters contested it and contested it brilliantly. When it came for discussion in the Lok Sabha in May 1951, four years after independence, Prime Minister Nehru said, and I quote him, so far as I am concerned, that particular section is highly objectionable and obnoxious and should have no place both for pra practical and historical reasons. End of quote. Notwithstanding this, it has remained on the statute book till now and has been used frequently enough against those who articulate views not to the liking of the authorities. It was only in July last year that the Law Commission of India initiated a, consultative, a consultation paper to a certain views on what it called public friendly amendments to the law so that it can be misused to curb free speech. On individual conduct in public affairs, modern India's record can only be described as patchy. There is enough in the public domain to substantiate this. I have only to mention official documents like the Vora Committee Report of 1993 and the Ethics in Governance Report of the Second Administrative Reform Commission of 2007. No less scathing is the Transparency International India's report of the same year. Together, they bring out the moral crisis in the ranks of public figures involved in statecraft. Nothing has happened since then to belie these perceptions. Individual conduct apart, what then has been the record of the Indian state in such matters? The Constitution prescribed a set of rights and duties. We dedicated ourselves to the concept of rule of law and established legislative, executive, and judicial institutions to implement these principles. Together, they constitute a charter of citizenship that, was, that would pass, it was hoped, the test of Gandhian principles. And yet, credible observers have spoken of the rule of law being under serious threat and of cancerous developments eating into the fabric of each institution. This is a far cry from what Professor Upendra Bakshi has sought to read in the rule of law as going beyond a mere division of functions in modes of governance. To him, it is the rule of good law and is as such reflective of the struggle of a people to make power accountable, governance just, and state ethical. He adds that the Indian constitutional conception of the rule of law links in 
links four core notions of rights, development, governance, and justice. Our failure on these counts is thus writ large. The saving grace is our dedication to them even as distant horizons. Alongside our commitment to liberal democracy reflective of the ground reality of a plural society is being diluted in favor of an illiberal or ethnic one premised on cultural vigilantism and its attendant consequences. The preamble enjoins us to secure fraternity. Instead, today, we have a pervasive intolerance, forgetting Gandhiji's observation that intolerance betrays want of faith in one's own cause. The nation in the making exercise has thus clearly deviated from the Gandhian principles, even if the ritual homage to Gandhi continues to be offered year after year. One can fervently hope that this nation in making exercise is not leading us to being a nation of hypocrites. Jai Hind. Thank you. Sri Hamid Ansari has very kindly agreed to take a couple of questions, uh, even though he's not obliged to, this being a keynote address, but in the spirit of dialogue and discussion, which is the hallmark of the History Congress, where we question the mightiest, I think this, he's honored that tradition and agreed. So may I request any of you who'd like to make a brief comment or a brief question to please go ahead. Yes? You didn't say yes? You wanted to speak? No. You're pointing. To... Is there anybody who would like to ask a question? No? All right. Well, in that case, uh, I will just say that uh, uh, Ansari Saab has pointed to us the grave dangers that we face today in the nation building project and he has shown to us how the Gandhian ideals, particularly the ethical ideals, are something that we do not seem to be adhering to uh, very closely at all. Gandhiji's great ambition of making politics moral and ethical he said it again and again that he was not interested in a politics which did not have morality in it, which did not have ethics in it. And that great ideal which he put before us and which he practiced is something that we seem to be not really adhering to. He's also pointed out to our grave, one of our gravest, I think, weaknesses of paying ritual homage very quick to observe centenaries and anniversaries of all kinds and not paying enough attention to actually practicing the principles of the, which are put forward by our great uh, leaders and thinkers before us. And these are some of the things we need to look inwards and see where we have strayed, why have we gone wrong. And those ideals are before us. And he's particularly pointed to the recent dangers, as he said, of vigilantism, which has come before us. 
He also, I think, made a very profound statement where he quotes Gandhi to say that intolerance means that you do not have confidence in your own project. Intolerance does not come out of self-confidence. It comes out of a feeling of inferiority. You do not have the courage to debate and discuss and faith in the rightness of your own cause that you will be able to win. And that's when you become intolerant and want to use other means, means other than dialogue, discussion, argument, to suppress those who may differ from you or who may oppose you. I would like to thank him for bringing these very valuable principles uh, before us and giving a direction to the discussions which we are going to hold uh, today and tomorrow. I'm sure many of the papers will engage themselves with issues which are related to these very fundamental issues. And it is, in fact, in the effort to take commemorations away from ritualism and lip service that this panel has been organized, where we want free debate, discussion, criticism to happen in a free uh, and tolerant uh, atmosphere where we emphasize on the Gandhian tradition of dialogue and debate and moving forward through that rather than through the other means which we have become, seem to have become fonder of in recent times. With these words on your behalf and on behalf of the Indian History Congress, I thank Sri Ansari for coming here today, sparing his valuable time. He came all the way from Delhi to address us, and we hope that he will continue to patronize and participate in the deliberations of the Indian History Congress in future years as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mukherjee. Thank you, uh, our keynote uh, speaker. Uh, the Indian History Congress premises are used by academics from all parts of the um, country to get their books released. The smart one gets smart speakers and they are always in search of time <laughs> and the smartest one wins. Generally, that is not the pr principle that we adhere to in, <laughs> in social philosophy that we adhere to. But anyway, we have a very nice um, uh, book to be released uh, and the author wanted to get it released by uh, the speaker today and gift it to the speaker. Please come, generate this up. <laughs> that is the gift, that is the gift. Is the <laughs> With these words, let me thank all of you for being here for this first session. Let me thank the speakers and um, our keynote speaker, Mr. Hamidan Sarisa, for having this um, moment for us. Thank you so much. We begin the next session uh, with very short uh, break.
uh, <coughs> we uh, now request Professor Sucheta Mahajan to come and chair the next session. And we have two very distinguished speakers, Professor <coughs> Purushottam Magarwal and Professor Midula Mukherjee, to speak. Can I do some backbenching now? Yeah. Miss that occasion in the last.